Finding your destiny is not easy. Some people manage to do this only in adulthood. Unfortunately, by this point, such a trail of unpleasant acquaintances can drag behind a person that it can be dangerous. Today, we are going to tell a story about the treachery, hypocrisy and meanness that led to the tragedy. Joseph Sagnier was born in 1955th year in a respected medical family in Shreveport, Louisiana, USA. And since childhood, he wanted to continue the family business. He received a Bachelor of Medical Sciences degree from the University of Baton Rouge in 1976 year, graduating with honors. Then, he graduated from Louisiana State University in Shreveport. In parallel with his studies at the university, Joseph worked at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where he was appointed chief resident in his last year of study. After completing his studies, he began working as a pathologist and a partner in the laboratory, which he later sold. At the time of the events described, Dr. Sadnier was still working at the laboratory as director and was also listed as the chief pathologist of the Covenant Health System in Loboca, Texas. Dr. Joseph Sadnier was a respected and wealthy pathologist who became a real godsend for one lady. He was a single man, famous in the city, enjoyed his freedom, status and money, but this was not always the case, since he married his high school sweetheart Becky at the age of 19. Two sons were born in this marriage. He was quite a strict father, but it paid off and was always compensated by justice. The man believed that strict discipline was needed with boys. Thanks to this, the sons have grown up to be responsible and worthy people. In general, their family life was going well, but after 27 years of marriage, the spouse found another man with whom she fell in love. The woman honestly told her husband about it. They eventually divorced. But Becky did not have a happy future with a new man because her lover turned out to be a dangerous person. Sometime after the marriage, he shot her, then the dog, and then took his own life. Fortunately, children who were already adults and lived separately did not suffer in this tragedy. Dr. Sadnier was shocked by this monstrous death of his ex-wife, but he did not suspect that his future was also stained with blood. Meanwhile, the years passed, Joseph supported his two sons. In 2007 year, a man moved from Dallas to Pubic to start a new life. Joseph planned to continue working and enjoy life, to try what he had not yet had time to appreciate in his life. For example, dancing. So the pathologist started going to dance lessons. He liked the classes, including because he met different women here. The man did not lose hope of finding his love. A couple of times, he tried to build a relationship with his dancing partners, but nothing came of it. This went on for quite a long time, until in July of the 2011th year, 56-year-old Joseph met the one who turned out to be his destiny. Her name was Richard Shatino. She was a 47-year-old beautiful sweet woman, almost 10 years younger than the man. Before meeting Rochelle, she worked for a long time as a manager in the NFL, built a successful career, and did not need anything. The woman also had four children of her own, who had already grown up. The couple had a lot in common. It's not surprising that they quickly got along and after a while, they literally fell head over heels in love with each other. They started spending more and more time together. For example, Rochelle's birthday was celebrated in Paris. Then Joseph took her to Los Angeles to meet his family. The solvency of the pathologist made it possible to easily break into any trip, regardless of the scale and cost of the trip. The relationship developed. So, the partners came to the desire to marry. By this point, Joseph had no idea that his new lover was a real-time bum, and it was dangerous to meet her. The situation got out of control. On the 11th of July, 2012, the landscape designer, who arrived at the doctor's house to discuss the upcoming renovation, called the Rescue Service 911. He said that he had come to his customer and wanted to inspect his courtyard. The employee could not reach the owner, but noticed that the door was open. 
The designer thought that Joseph just didn't hear him. The man went inside and started calling him. The designer saw a mess in the house, and the most suspicious thing was that he found a bullet hole in the window near the front door. Everything looked like a hack and caused concern. The contractor carefully went further inside in search of the owner of the house, but he was nowhere to be found. Then the designer went into the garage. In the garage, he found Dr. Sagnier lying in a pool of blood on the floor without signs of life. He had knife and gunshot wounds on his body. Therefore, the employee immediately left the house and called 911. At 1448, the police department received a call and several patrols were immediately sent to the place. Officers arrived and found the victim of the crime, who were quickly identified as 57-year-old Joseph Sadnier. Doctors pronounced the death of a well-known pathologist. This suspicious crime took place in one of the most peaceful, safe and prestigious areas of the city. There is almost zero crime here, so the event stirred up the whole public. The wealthy pathologist had no enemies, and all his friends and family called him one of the most calm and good-natured people they knew. He was a representative of a respected profession and had no obvious detractors who would like to harm him. It immediately became obvious that this was not a robbery since nothing from the house was stolen. However, the window was broken and a bottle with a shot through the bottom was also found. It seemed that it was used like an improvised silencer for firearms. At the crime scene, detectives found out that the victim had been killed in his house for quite some time, the blood had dried, and the body had cooled down, and rigor mortis had set in. The approximate time of death was determined. It turned out that the man died at night. Criminologists immediately arrived at the scene to establish the circumstances of the crime and collect evidence for examination. There were plenty of materials, as the attacker seemed to be slightly worried about not leaving them. It is obvious that the criminal was not a professional, but a novice in this case. DNA was collected at the crime scene from a bottle that was used as a silencer. It was also possible to find blood samples of two people at once. All these materials were sent to the laboratory for examination. The interviewed neighbors claimed that they had not seen or heard anything suspicious. There were no surveillance cameras near the house. According to investigators, the attacker entered the house through the back door. Using a large panoramic window, it overlooked the backyard. So the passage was very convenient for an unexpected attack. In the dining room, the attacker collided with his victim, and the shooting began. Most likely, it was at this moment that a bottle of wine was used as a silencer. But, of course, this did not work. Apparently, the doctor was still alive after that. Traces of blood were found, which were dragged behind the wounded man. The man moved along the corridor and went into the garage. It was here that the attacker began to inflict knife wounds on his victim, which became fatal for him. During the autopsy of the victim's body, five gunshot wounds and eleven knife wounds were found. Initially, the detectives did not believe that this was a random crime, but they needed to find out who did it and why. Naturally, first of all, they began to check the pathologist's immediate environment. The children and the family of the deceased were in shock. Just two years ago, his ex-wife Becky was shot dead by her new husband, and now their father was killed in a similar cruel way. Lightning literally struck twice in the same place, which looked too suspicious. The murder of Joseph was the second shock for the children of the family, which they were forced to experience after the emotionally devastating death of their own mother. For two years, they were left without parents. At one time, Becky's murder deeply wounded Dr. Sadnier, who lived with her for a little less than three decades. The man repeatedly recalled the years he lived with her and grieved for the loss. However, the doctor remained strong and a support for the family. He immediately took care of all organizational issues and funeral expenses and helped his sons survive the trauma. Later, the children admitted that it was his support that helped each of them overcome this pain. The sons of the victims 
wondered who could wish harm to their father. He was a support for many people, not only relatives, but also friends, as well as colleagues at work. He was a charming and pleasant man, with a fortune of about $12 million, but he never flaunted his dignity and wealth, remaining quite modest. All of this made him virtually one of the most eligible middle-aged bachelors in town. Naturally, many women sympathized with Dr. Sonia, which became especially noticeable after he started going to dances. From that moment on, the charismatic millionaire literally had no end of interested ladies. It was here that he met his new lover, who was willingly accepted by the whole family. Rochelle was beautiful, funny and funny. After meeting, the couple began to relax in the best restaurants and private clubs in the city. And not only that, Joseph spared nothing for his beloved, showered her with gifts. At that time, the woman was 47 years old. She was literally crazy about her new man. Many confirmations of these words were found, in particular, numerous publications on her personal page in social networks, where Rochelle openly declared her love for the rich doctor. All this was also confirmed by numerous witnesses familiar with the heroes of the story. Friends and acquaintances had high hopes for this relationship. Joseph had been a bachelor for a long time, he could not build a serious relationship, but it seemed that now a worthy woman appeared in his life, whom he was ready to marry. The closest person to the victim was his beloved Rochelle, with whom they were inseparable. So first of all the detectives talked to her. She called the deceased the love of her life and did not imagine that something like this could happen to her. The woman was genuinely upset by what had happened and did not know how to live on. During a conversation with the police, Rochelle shared some interesting information. She said that, in the last months before the tragedy, various oddities were observed in the lovers' lives. It was pointed out to Joseph that he was a victim of persecution, which he repeatedly shared with his fiancée. Rochelle also said that she herself once saw a stranger who looked pretty creepy. One rainy night, an outsider stood in front of the house for a long time, looking at the door and windows as if he was watching them, but she did not see his face. At the same time, the woman said that the future husband tried to translate everything into a joke and apparently underestimated the danger of the situation. Rochelle told about the intrusive calls that began to arrive to her fiancé shortly before his death. He received several calls and threats after which it was repeated in the form of several text messages. After thinking about what happened, Richelle put forward several candidates for the role of potential killers at once. However, the police did not believe the woman for a long time, believing that one of the likely motives could be her jealousy. Thanks to some witnesses, it became known that at the time of the crime, the deceased communicated with several women at once and was in a romantic relationship with them. However, some people refuted these rumors, referring to the slander that a famous doctor was subjected to shortly before the tragedy. Investigators asked Rochelle if she knew that the groom could have a relationship on the side. The woman replied that she was not aware of this and denied that Joseph could have had mistresses. It was completely out of character for a man. Joseph's sons also denied having mistresses. They knew how decent their father was, and he would never build a relationship on the side. Amid the obvious suspicions of the police, Rochelle claimed that she was not involved in the crime. Nevertheless, already at the next interrogation, she began to cry and said that she knew several women at once who could be involved in the murder. According to the suspect, there were several exes who constantly harassed the doctor and their pressure has increased in recent months. Joseph ignored them, but they kept bothering him and were unhappy that he was dating Rochelle and getting ready for the wedding. One of them was a woman from Florida who called herself the doctor's dance teacher. She continued to call and write even after Sanier told her about a serious relationship with Rochelle. She also suspected the involvement of another nurse with whom the pathologist worked some time ago. The woman also regularly called and wrote to him. The third 
was a woman with her daughter who shortly before the murder wrote a threatening letter to the deceased where she accused Joseph of abandoning her with the child, although this was not true. Also, in addition to these women, Rochelle was among the first to point out Mike Dixon, who worked as a plastic surgeon in his private clinic. There, he was engaged in cosmetology, beauty procedures, and plastic surgery. The clinic was located in another city, Amarilla, a couple of hours away by car from the book. The doctor really could have had a motive for attacking Joseph, since Rochelle was his former lover, and their separation was very difficult. Mike met her in 2000, when she came for Botox injections. Initially, friendly communication began between them, then a light flirtation, after a spark slipped between them, and the romance began. The doctor started cheating on his wife with a new lover, but a few months later, his wife found out about it and filed for divorce. But the plastic surgeon didn't seem to care. He was so much in love with Rochelle that he divorced his wife with whom he had been married for about 20 years. Mike was determined. They continued to meet with their mistress, but also broke up in 2010 year. Rochelle described Mike as a manipulator who tried to take total control of everything. Even after the breakup, he pursued her for a long time and did not give her peace, asked her to return. So Rochelle decided to move in order to get rid of him. After considering all the circumstances, the woman believed that it was her ex, Mike Dixon, who was involved in spying on the doctor in recent months. She said that the final period of their relationship was terrible. They resembled a real swing, which was unsettling. Rochelle called the former a real ladies' man, a ladies' man who could not miss a single skirt, prone to emotional violence, so they broke up. The main reason she called a lull. Mike constantly deceived and pretended to be someone who was not really, and when Rochelle saw his true face, she was disappointed. But even though he moved to another city, Mike found her and continued to get her. According to the woman, he was emotionally shocked after he found out that she was dating a new man, Joseph. He understood that now he would definitely not be able to get her back so he even suggested that they be together despite the existing relationship. However, the proposal to form a love triangle did not work. Rochelle flatly refused. The woman said that it was after this that she began to feel constant surveillance of herself, and Joseph also told her about it. One day, she and her lover saw something resembling a camera flash through the backyard window. But until the end, they did not realize the seriousness of the problem. Mike Dixon interested investigators who wanted to talk to him. The plastic surgeon lived two hours away from the town of Pubic. Police officers came to him for questioning, as during this period he was the main suspect in the case. Mike willingly went to talk to the detectives. He confessed that he was really head over heels in love with Rochelle. A man has changed a lot in his life for her, including a divorce from his wife. He did everything possible for them to be together. Unfortunately, they eventually broke up, which was a big blow for Mike. The plastic surgeon admitted that he had indeed been stalking her for some time, but not for threats, but in an attempt to return his beloved. But Rochelle continued to reject the man, and eventually, he resigned himself and found himself another woman. At that time, Dixon was dating a medical student who was much younger than him, and claimed that he had forgotten Rochelle and no longer pursued her, especially her fiancé, and denied having anything to do with the murder. The new girl became his alibi, since at the time of the crime, he was first at work and then with her. Convincing evidence and video materials were found to confirm the doctor's words. The police have reached a dead end. The only persons involved in this case had an alibi including the beloved Sonia herself. Detectives were trying to find people who could harbor a grudge against the doctor, were jealous of him, or wanted to profit. However, there were no new defendants in this case. By this time, the results of the tests came from the laboratory. DNA samples from the bottle did not belong to the victim. One of the blood samples found at the crime scene was a sample of Sagnir, 
According to the police database, it was not possible to determine whose other samples were found at the scene. They had to be compared with samples of the suspect to prove guilt. But the problem was that there were no suspects. A few days later, the police station received a call from an aspiring medic and a dirty guy named Paul Reynolds. According to him, he lived with a friend who recently confessed to the murder of Loboka. After that, he tried to pass away, but he was saved. The friend Paul was talking about was named Dave Shepard. According to the witness, the killer told him how he got into the house and shot the man, and the caller voiced such details that were known only to a narrow circle of detectives, including about the silencer from the bottle. A random person simply could not know them. It turns out that he was clearly aware of what had happened. The police immediately checked the new suspect. It turned out that Dave had a stormy criminal past, theft, hooliganism, although nothing serious had happened so far. The man was divorced and had no job. However, he was repeatedly seen stealing, including $30,000 from a well-known businessman. The new suspect was a friend of Paul's caller. The guy said about Davy that he was sociable, but pompous and sometimes arrogant. In general, there was a rather unattractive image of a native of the criminal world. According to Paul, Dable was hired to kill some doctor connected with plastic surgery, but he didn't know his name. According to a friend who contacted the police, in the last few days, Dave was depressed, constantly drunk and under the influence of illegal substances. He behaved irrationally and seemed ready to take his own life out of desperation. It was in this state that the performer began to tell about the incident to Paul, who decided to report it to the police. Detectives wanted to talk to a new suspect. Immediately after the police arrived, Dave began to behave very agitated. He gave confused answers to questions and was generally very suspicious. When he was told about what the investigation knew, he gradually split. According to Dave, Mike Dixon really hired him for the murder, after which he provided a detailed account of the chronology of the events of that fateful day. The criminal said that he met a plastic surgeon couple. They turned out to be kindred spirits, as both were going through difficult breakups with their companions during this period. New acquaintances started talking under a bottle of beer, and it turned into a friendship, trying to find mutual understanding. Mike shared his sad love story, telling a ritual who left him and was with another at that time. The man shared that this separation hit him hard. He loved this woman madly, could not forget her. Dr. Dixon changed a lot in his life to be with Rochelle. I wanted to marry her, but instead she just left. Mike clearly wanted his beloved back. To do this, he believed it was necessary to remove one single obstacle from the way Dr. Sadnier, the plastic surgeon, believed that then his beloved would be with him. Dave supported his newfound friend in this endeavor. As a result, the new friends came up with a plan, but not a murder. According to their plan, Joseph was planned to be slandered by exposing him in a dishonest light, and then Rochelle would leave him. First of all, they decided to act out harassment and complaints from the man's former lovers. It was after this that a letter was written in which an unknown woman with a child confessed that Joseph had abandoned them. But the pathologist denied everything and Rochelle believed him. Their plan failed. Now it became clear that the authors of this note were two malefactors who were preparing a conspiracy to implement the plan. They found women who were paid a decent sum about a thousand dollars each, so that they would act out this performance and pursue an unknown man for staging. In fact, there were no women on Joseph's side. Also, the camera flash that Rochelle once saw with her lover was actually the light of Dave's mobile phone. He regularly went to the victim's house, acting out surveillance. All these trips were financed by Mike Dixon each time given money for gasoline and to pay for his work. However, espionage and slander did not allow the lovers to be separated. In this case, 
the organizer of the crime had a plan B, which implied more radical actions. Mike decided to kill the pathologist, having previously tarnished his good name with false accusations. The man believed that after that, Rochelle would literally crawl to him on her knees so that he would take her back. The plan also required the services of his new friend Dave. As payment, Dixon offered three silver bars, the total value of which was about $10,000, and he agreed. He immediately gave one of the bars to Dave as a deposit. After that, the criminal went to a pawn shop and cashed the reward he received. Dave told the police how they were preparing for the crime. Dr. Dixon immediately gave him a gun, and the performer had to follow the pathologist to find out his daily routine and determine the best moment for an attack. He was watching the victim. The plastic surgeon wanted to know exactly what was going on in Joseph's house, so he constantly kept in touch with the mercenary, literally in real time. At the appointed hour, while Sonia was still not at home, the killer arrived and sat in a chair in the backyard. Here, Dave settled down in a bandana, glasses and with a bag, waiting for the target of the attack to return home. He had a pistol with a bottle of wine on the tip of the barrel, instead of a silencer, a pair of gloves and a knife. The main weapon was supposed to be a pistol, but in case of failure, a knife was a backup option. If this did not work, then the attacker had a belt with him, which was intended to strangle the victim. Throughout the entire crime, as well as before it, the customer constantly exchanged messages with his mercenary. Later, these correspondents were discovered and became one of the material evidence at the trial. However, from the very beginning, the crime did not go according to plan. As soon as Joseph got home late at night, he noticed a stranger on the porch of the backyard. Then he came up and knocked on the inside to attract Dave's attention and drive away the uninvited guest. The future victim of the attack opened the window and politely asked Dave what he was doing on his private territory. At that moment, the attacker took out a weapon and fired several times, but he failed to kill the man. Then. He crawled inside through an open and already broken window, damaging it completely, and then made several more shots. But that didn't kill the victim either. Joseph tried to get away from the attacker along the corridor. Dave was afraid that the wounded man had a weapon. He would take it and resist, so he immediately rushed after him and began to finish off Sonia with a knife already in the garage. After several blows, the pathologist fell to the floor and stopped showing signs of life. Then, the mercenary struck three or four more blows, aiming at the vital organ for life. After making sure that the man was dead, Mike headed back to Morila to tell his customer about everything in detail. When the mercenary returned, he immediately received the two remaining ingots of precious metal, as well as a box of Cuban cigars. Thanks for the work done. Mike Dixon listened to the detailed report, and praised Dave. He treated and bandaged the wounds that the performer received during the struggle, after which he recommended lying low for a while. There was plenty of evidence of the killer's words. For example, there was a random photo on his mobile phone that he took against the background of a mirror when he was in the victim's house. Also, his DNA samples matched the samples at the crime scene. Geolocation of Dave's mobile phone showed that he was at the victim's house at the time of the crime. Dr. Dixon was arrested by the police on charges of first-degree murder based on Dave's testimony, as well as a lot of other evidence, including incriminating phone calls and text messages exchanged by the conspirators with unambiguous messages. Already at the first interrogation, the detectives hoped to get a confession from the instigator of the murder, but Mike Dixon literally pretended to be stupid, claiming that he did not understand what kind of Dr. Sonia was talking about at all. As soon as the police put pressure on the man, presenting the available evidence against him, the plastic surgeon demanded a lawyer. The trial has begun, Dave Shepard, as part of a deal with the prosecution immediately admitted his guilt as a killer in court and waived the right to appeal the verdict. As a result, instead of the death penalty, 
he received a life sentence without the right to parole. However, Mike Dixon turned out to be a tough nut to crap. He appeared in court, still claiming to be innocent. The prosecutor's office accused the doctor of aggravated murder, but they did not request the highest measure for him, since the probability of such a decision on the part of the jury was too low. Despite the fact that there was some evidence against Dr. Dixon, it was indirect and could be refuted. The lawyer made a lot of efforts to present an impeccable image of the defendant with an impeccable reputation at work and in life. The defense lawyer denied Dade's testimony and also questioned the authenticity of the correspondence and their meaning. Despite the best efforts of the prosecution, the jury decided that Dixon was innocent. A lot of confusion was caused by the perpetrator of the crime himself, who, although he testified against the customer at the trial as part of a deal with the prosecution, but clearly began to protect his employer and said at the trial that he completely planned and executed the murder himself. Two jurors who were present at the first trial expressed reasonable doubts. In the end, the proceedings were declared invalid. However, the victim's family did not give up, so the case was relaunched. New hearings began in 2016 year after the announcement of all the materials of the case. The jury discussed what they heard for about three hours until they decided that the defendant was really guilty of first-degree murder. Under state law, this article is punishable by death. Since they refused to request the highest measure, the doctor was automatically sentenced to life imprisonment without the right to parole. One of the most significant evidence in the prosecution of the murderer was made by his own daughter. Also convincing evidence of Mike's guilt was Paul's testimony, which Dave handed over to the police. Paul claimed that Dave had told him how Dr. Dixon had hired him to kill. In addition to other useful information, Dixon's daughter pointed out that the father is covering for his customer. However, the plastic surgeon continued to claim that he was not involved in the death of his rival on the romantic front. Dr. Dixon remained dissatisfied with the verdict, and the defenders were outraged by it. The lawyers appealed, and this allowed to get the court decision overturned. Dixon was released on bail of $2 million, but the fight for justice was not over. The prosecutor's office sought reinstatement of the sentence by the state's highest criminal court, otherwise a third trial was expected. The petition from the prosecutor's office was filed on February 11, 2019. The next stage of the trial was April 2020 year. During this period, the bail of the accused was revoked and an arrest warrant was issued for him again. The decision was made by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, overturning the decision made by the lower court. His sentence was reinstated. The judge concluded that the criminal should continue to serve his life sentence without the right to parole. Dixon is currently being held behind bars at the detention center in Lobo, Texas. While all these shocks and trials were taking place, the heroine of the story, Rochelle, who became a stumbling block for the two men, preferred to lead a quiet, quiet life, the details of which are unknown. She stayed in this city but completely shielded herself from the attention of journalists and the public. The woman even filed a lawsuit in the 2016 year against a magazine that described in detail the love triangle between her criminal and the victim. In this article, she was exposed as a divorced woman who sought to destroy marriages and hunted for money. She demanded compensation for moral damage in the amount of $2 million, but compensation was refused. Despite her reluctance to popularize her life, Rochelle has repeatedly communicated with representatives of the media. The woman felt guilty for actually bringing the criminal to the threshold of a truly loving and honest man who became a victim of his unhealthy desire to possess and control her. If you liked my work, subscribe to the channel, support this video with a like, and also let's discuss this story in the comments. I recommend watching these videos. Thank you all and bye.